Welcome to the worship of Almighty God here at Wexford Community Presbyterian Church. My name is Tyler. I'm the pastor here, and it is a wonderful day to worship God together. Happy Resurrection Day. He is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Thank you for being here. Let's worship God together. Let no one caught in sin remain inside the valley of inward shame, but fix our eyes. On the cross, and run to Him who showed great love and led for us. Freely You led for us. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling over death by death. Come away, come away, come and rise up from the grave. Christ is risen from the dead. We are one with Him again. Come away, come away. Come and rise up from the grave. Beneath the weight of all our sin, you bow to none but heaven's will. You seem of hell, no scoffer's crown, no burden. From the dead, trampling over death by death. Come away, come away, come and rise up from the grave. Christ is risen from the dead, we are one with Him again. Come away, come away, come and rise up from the grave. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, hell. Where is your victory, oh church? Come stand in the light. The glory of God has defeated the light. Sing it, oh death. Where is your sting, oh hell? Where is your victory, oh church? Come stand in the light. Our God is not dead, He's alive, He's alive. He's risen from the dead, trampling over death by death. Come away, come away, come and rise up from the grave. Christ is risen from the dead, we are one with Him again. Come away, come away, come and rise up from the grave. One of the many joys that we have in being able to gather in this virtual space each and every week is to greet one another with the love of Christ. We can do this even in this virtual space by reaching out to people, texting, calling, emailing, doing whatever you need to do. Uh, and so uh, now we're going to ask you to pause the video, do whatever you need to do, have a long conversation with someone, greet them a Merry Easter and, and uh, say Christ is risen, Christ is risen indeed, all that. Have a conversation with someone, spend some time with people, reach out to someone you haven't talked to in a while and let them know how much you care about them and how much you appreciate that they're in your life. So. Let's pause the video and let's greet one another with the love of Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of endless life and new beginnings, we give thanks for your goodness and steadfast love. Now hear our prayers. For the church throughout the world, that they may be faithful witnesses to the resurrection so that all may come to know and have new life in Christ. For the people and leaders of every nation, that your boundless grace will show no partiality might bring Christ's reign of peace and justice to all. For all who are despised, rejected, and oppressed, 
that they may know the liberating power of the gospel and rejoice and be glad in the day of the Lord. For those who weep like Mary at the tomb, that their tears of sorrow may turn to cries of joy in the presence of the risen Christ. For the promise of a new creation where all creatures may live together in safety and none shall hurt or destroy on your holy mountain. God, our strength and salvation, we pray all these things in resurrection hope and with the confidence that you have already answered us. Through Christ, who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever, and who taught us how to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. He is risen. This week's Gospel reading is from Mark chapter 16, verses 1-8. through 8. Listen to the word of the Lord. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they could go and anoint Jesus' dead body. Very early on, the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they came to the tomb. They were saying to each other, Who's going to roll the stone away from the entrance for us? When they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, and it was a very large stone. Going into the tomb, they saw a young man in a white robe seated on the right side, and they were startled. But he said to them, Don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He isn't here. Look, here's the place where they laid him. Go, tell his disciples, especially Peter, that he is going ahead of you into Galilee. You will see him there just as he told you. Overcome with terror and dread, they fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Several years ago, I asked a group of my friends if they wanted to read the book Dune uh, by Frank Herbert. Dune was this classic science fiction book that was written in the uh, late 1950s and became very influential on all the science fiction that followed it. A lot of major science fiction things copied elements from it. Star Wars copied pretty liberally from Dune. Um, and I'd been trying to read this book for 20 years. I'd never read it because it's really complicated. It's hard to read. Uh, and I just couldn't get it done. So I, I said to my friends, like, hey, do you want to read this book together? Like, we'll all kind of join a, a book group and, and read it and encourage each other. They all said, yeah. And so we all read it and it was great. Uh, I highly recommend Dune. It's really hard to read, uh, but it's really good. It's, it's, it's a lot more political and sociological than anything. Kind of nothing happens, but also a ton of stuff happens. Uh, but it was great. And we were really excited about it. We kept on reading through the series. The series, each book gets weirder and weirder and harder to read and more philosophical, less about anything exciting. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so we kept going and then, uh, then we found out that they were making a movie and, uh, this was just a, a, about four years ago that they, they announced that they were going to make this movie and, and we got really excited. Uh, we thought it could be great. There was a movie in the 80s and it was terrible. Uh, but this was a new director. We were really excited about it. And so the movie then got delayed because of the pandemic. It was supposed to come out in 2020 and then they said that it was going to come out in 2021. And it was right as we were coming back and everything was kind of opened back up. And so in October 2021, we were going to go see Dune. At this point, it was just one movie. It was not... Uh, communicated at all, really, that it was going to be more than one movie. Uh, they said they might make more in the series, but as I said, there's six books in the series. There's also beyond books like that, but there, there's a lot more that you can do with Dune. And so I thought, if this is a success, maybe they'll make this next book. And so we go into the theater. Everybody, it's a full theater. It ended up making a ton of money. It was a big success, and it got nominated for Best Picture. But this first screening, this kind of midnight screening that we went to, uh, we get about two hours into this two and a half hour movie and, and those of us that have read the book start to realize I don't think this is going to end I, I don't think that they're going to get the whole story in here because they have not there's so much that they haven't done yet there's only like 45 minutes left in this movie and if you watch that first movie it gets to the end and it kind of concludes but it just kind of stops more than anything and then it just says that's it 
and it doesn't even at that point say to be continued in Dune 2 it just it just done um because I think when it was released, they didn't have the funding for a second movie. And then it got, within a month of its uh, release, they said, okay, yeah, we're going to make another one. Uh, they ended up making another one. The second one ends kind of the same way, where it just kind of stops. Uh, so they're definitely going to make a third one. But that, I, I remember the feeling in the theater where no one was ready by that. Every Everyone was surprised that this ending, it felt like it was building towards something, and then it just kind of stops. And that's the end of the story. That feeling is the same feeling we, we should get when we read the Gospel of Mark. Because that's how Mark's version of the resurrection actually ends. Now, if you were reading along in your Bible, you may have noticed that oftentimes there's extra verses at the end. There's a verse 9 through, I think, like 16. And if you read those verses, most Bibles, any good Bible you have, is going to note the fact that that is not part of the original manuscript. It's going to like have a have it indented or have a, like a chunk between it and something like that. And when you read that, it does seem kind of weird. It's like, and then Jesus cast out a bunch of demons from Mary Magdalene. And then all of the disciples started handling snakes. And if they got bit by poison, they were fine. Like it didn't, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. It was very weird. And so what that actually means is that the original manuscripts, the original scrolls that uh, Mark was written down on, the oldest ones we can find, uh, don't have those last that last chunk the weird chunk in it they all end at verse 8 where we ended today and they don't end like the scroll was torn off and like wait a minute i'm missing the last page of this book but it actually uh ends there that was the conclusion and that was the intended ending the ending that's added on later isn't added for like another hundred years so it's way later it doesn't make any sense it doesn't fit with the language of mark it's definitely added from other traditions as the church was bringing in this stuff it's probably paraphrasing some of the stuff that we get from mark and luke that come later. Um, and uh, we know that because the way that the Bible was written out is that they had these scrolls and the oldest ones that they had from a long time ago did include those passages. But then when they were able to find new scrolls that were older and a lot of them that were able to consistently date these to around the time of Christ, about 70 years after Christ um, was born, um, they were able to realize that that ending, the ending that doesn't make as much sense, wasn't part of the original ending. And so this story just kind of ends like, wait, wait a minute, <laughs> we need a little bit more. There's no Jesus in this story. There's no resurrected Jesus at the end of the story. There's a guy telling us that there's a resurrected Jesus, but that's it. Uh, what do we do with that? <laughs> And, and the other interesting thing, too, is that, uh, so this, this guy, they get to the tomb. I mean, really, so the, the women are going to the tomb on uh, that Sunday. They didn't go on Saturday because Saturday was the Sabbath, and they're not allowed to do anything on the Sabbath. And on Friday, what should have happened is that one, their friend died. Uh, they should have anointed his body and, and put oils on him and put myrrh on him, actually. Myrrh, uh, if you remember the gift from the Christmas story that one of the wise men brings, that myrrh was an oil uh, that is used, would anoint bodies and, and used in lieu of um, uh, um, embalming. So in modern days, we embalm bodies so that they uh, are preserved a little bit longer. They didn't have, uh, most people didn't have the ability to do that. That, that method was devised by the Egyptians, but um, for most cases, they could just rub oils on there that would preserve the body a little bit and, and help um, kind of bless the body. And myrrh was a, a huge part of that. So uh, it's, it's foretold in the gifts of the Magi, uh, this story of Jesus. And so they were going to do this and they were, they would have done it on Friday, but they weren't allowed to because everything happened so hastily and, and the body was stuck in a tomb really quick and they couldn't go on Saturday because Saturday was the Sabbath. And so this is the first chance they get and they're not going expecting, this is Mary, the mother, Mary Magdalene and Salome. Uh, this is the only time we see, see Salome. Um, but these women are going to the tomb to anoint their friend, to, to, um, to do the funeral rites, to, to mourn and to go through this process of, of care in a time of death and to do the things that they would have done had they been given the opportunity. And they, they're not going expecting to see, is he there? Did he rise from the dead? Is any of this? They're not going with any expectation other than to find their friend who has died. And really the only miraculous thing that they're, that they're even considering is, what are we going to do when we get there and there's that big stone in front of the tomb? Who's going to roll the stone away for us? And 
they aren't thinking like maybe God will move the stone or something like that, but they're thinking we got to get this figured out. There's three of us. Maybe we can move it together, but probably not because probably not three men can move it together. But I don't know. Maybe we'll find, we'll figure it out. We'll get there and then we'll find some folks to help us move the stone so that we can get to our friend and um, do these funeral rites. And so when they show up and the stone is rolled away, that is immediately got to be terrifying because immediately they're, they're thinking, well, something bad has happened here because not, oh, he is alive. <laughs> they're thinking uh, someone's probably messing with the body. Someone's probably stolen the body or desecrated the grave or something like that. There's no guard around. There's no anything here. And they go inside and they don't see a body, but they do see a, a man sitting there, a man all dressed in white, probably an angel. And it's probably an angel because there are other times when angels appear in it and, and notes that they look like men in specific times. Because if you remember from the Old Testament, uh, angels in the Bible are terrifying looking. They don't look like humans. They look like monsters. And so whenever angels show up, they say, don't be afraid, uh, because usually they look terrifying. And it notes at times when the angels are take on human form. And so this is probably an angel, definitely has some knowledge that we don't understand, and, and, and isn't just a guy who stole the body. He says uh, to them, hey, you're looking for Jesus, right? And they're like, yeah. And they're like, oh, well, he, he died, but he's not dead anymore. He rose from the dead. And uh, you need to go and tell everybody, tell his disciples, and especially tell Peter. Which is really important because uh, if you remember from the story prior to that, that, that uh, Peter had denied Jesus three times and, and was certainly feeling this shame, this rejection that he had betrayed his friend. And so there's something really important about um, him saying, not because Peter was more important than anybody else, but that Peter needs to, to know that Jesus is back and that, and that there is this chance for reconciliation that Peter was denied in thinking that his friend was killed. So go tell the disciples, tell Peter, and um, tell him, tell everybody that, that Jesus has gone ahead and we'll meet them in Galilee, where everything started. In Mark, everything starts in Galilee. And in our normal version of the story, they, the women go and tell them, and everything is fine. And then Jesus shows up and says, hey guys, I'm there. But that's not what happens in Mark. In Mark, the, the angel tells them, you should, the man tells them, hey, go tell everybody that Jesus is alive. And it says that they're so afraid that they ran away in fear and told no one. The end. <clears throat> Roll credits. Now that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, and we know also that, that that isn't the end because if that was the end, uh, we wouldn't know the story. Definitely they told somebody. It's almost like the there's an old joke that says, hey, can you keep a secret? And someone says, yeah, I can keep a secret. And like, oh, good, so can I. Like, it's, uh, it, it's kind of that, that they, they, they didn't not tell anybody because if they didn't tell someone, we would never know the story. There's certainly lots of other things that happened that we don't know about because no one told anyone and then they didn't write it down. So eventually they do tell, but that's not where this story ends. That's not how this one ends. And it's important for us to see this because really Easter has become such a not surprising story for us that it's, it's important for us to remember how shocking this is, how much that this is, the idea that Jesus is not dead is both, I mean, it's, it's great, but it's also terrifying. If you found out that a loved one that you uh, thought had died uh, that you saw die had returned to life. That would be great, but it would also be terrifying because it also means that now what does anything mean? Everything that I thought I knew about how the world works is that you live and you do as much as you can while you can and then you help people, but then you're going to die and when you die, that's it. And if you're telling me that now when you die, that's not it, that you might be able to come back, what does that mean? Also, how did he come back? Also, no one knew that Jesus was the Son of God. They didn't understand this. So they thought he was just a teacher. What does this mean? Are people going to start rising from the dead? Is Jesus someone I didn't think he was? Like, this is terrifying. It is a shift on our understanding of the world in a level that we can't handle. And so, of course, they're not going to tell anybody because they're terrified. Now, eventually they do, but that's not what this story is doing. The problem is we, we kind of see Easter not problem, but we, we, the way we think about Easter is we think of it as a, as the ending, as the conclusion to the story. It, it, it is we, what starts 
in from a New Testament standpoint, the story of Jesus starts with the Christmas story and ends with Easter and the Ascension. And then that's it. And then that's all we got from Jesus. And thank you very much. Here's your little gospel. Tell everybody about it. But it isn't the ending. It's a beginning. This story is much like how Dune ends and then the beginning of the next story. Like if you see the second one, it starts right at the ending of the first one. It's like the ending of Empire Strikes Back or the ending of Lord of the Rings, Fellowship of the Ring, Into the Two Towers. Like any story that is told in multiple parts, the second story may start where the other one ended, but it is a brand new story. It is telling another, uh, it's opening up the saga into a different direction. And now that we know about the resurrection to be true, now that people fully realize who Jesus is as uh, the son of God and what this actually meant, that he wasn't just a teacher who was saying interesting things, but he was someone who truly um, is different, then that changes everything. Then this starts a new story. Easter isn't just the conclusion of Lent and now we can just move on with ordinary time and just deal with our lives. It means everything is different. And we still live in a Good Friday world. We still live in a world where death is the end. Even though we, we tell ourselves as Christians that we believe that there's more than that, we still operate as though, well, you got to seize the day and get everything you can while you can, because one day you'll leave and just leave a good legacy. And, and, uh, the, the life that we have now is where we need all our comfort. So we got to build up our treasure here and, and make every, like save your money so that your kids will be like all of the things that are not inherently bad, but definitely show a lack of faith in anything beyond today. And this story ruins that. The whole gospel story overall ruins that narrative, that narrative that is focused, so focused on death that we're trying to live as much as we can before we die. And it forces, I mean, if death is the end, then everything we do, we better do as much as we can. We better uh, live while we're young because you only live once and all of the phrases that we get, like we better just make everything happen and not be boring because what a waste of time. And that's not how it works. The problem with when you when you see life as a finite thing, then it makes you selfish because everything is so precious that I don't have time to waste with you. I gotta go do stuff for me because I'm running out of time here. It's almost like if you're at an arcade and, and uh, uh, I've, I've been at arcades sometimes and they pay by the hour and you have a, um, a, a card that will get you into the games for the next hour. And if someone's like, I got to go to the bathroom can you, uh, or I got to do something, it's like, well, I can't for the next 10 minutes. I really got to play all the games that I can because uh, this, this card is only worth something for the next thing. If we think of life that way, then it, we're not going to help people as much as we can because we've only got this many hours before our card stops working. Easter and the resurrection changes that. It says, oh, no, I mean, there'll be other days we can play these things. There, the, and, and we don't need to, to do it all right now. There's going to be more time. There's going to be more uh, opportunities for us to be filled with joy and filled with love. And so we do have the opportunity to help people right now. It's okay if you give up some of your comforts to help people. But that's scary. And that's not how we live. And that changes the story. Easter is a whole lot easier for, for us to, to handle when, it, when that's the end, when it's the culmination of everything, when it's, when it's just Jesus is resurrected and that means that death has no sting and now we're fine and so we're going to go to heaven one day and there you go. And that's kind of why we treat it this way. Uh, but Mark doesn't treat it this way. It's not the end for Mark. It's the beginning of a new story. It's an abrupt stop to this story. And it's letting us know that everything is different. Everything that you thought is now different. Everything that you, you were, this whole story that we were following before, we need to start over and read it again, knowing what we know now. And seeing how when Jesus is saying stuff, it's not just smart stuff by a smart person. It is uh, God speaking to us. It is, it is God helping us to see that, that there's more to life than life, that there is more to, uh, to helping others than just simply making it comfortable right now. And so in, in many ways, it makes this life not as important, but it makes this life even more important because our energy shouldn't just be based on getting as much pleasure as we can with the time that we have. Our energy can be given to other people that we can truly love others the way that we are loved by God and give our time to other people. 
the Mark story really helps us to see that we are still part of this story, that it's not done. It's open-ended. It ends with, in the way that it ends uh, in the Greek is that it ends with this phrase, however. Kind of uh, like a, a non-conclusion. It's not a, a happily ever after. It's, however, they didn't tell anybody because they were scared. And because they were scared, uh, they just ran away and hit. And again, we know that that's not the end of the story, but we have to recognize that we would also hide, that this story is terrifying even to us. Easter is a beautiful thing, but it is not a conclusion. It is opening up a whole new world. It's, it's Harry Potter realizing he's a wizard. Like it's that level. It, it is recognizing like, oh, everything we thought is different. It is realizing that God is with us, that God loves us and God is involved and God is working in the world, not to judge the world or destroy the world, but to make something new and to change the way that we view our lives and that we view the lives of others. And it's not about winning people or convincing people or uh, conquering people or controlling people. It is about loving people. It is about viewing everything differently. It is about forgiving people and being joyful and being present and knowing that Christ is risen and to say that Christ is risen indeed. And that is a, is a challenge to us. It shouldn't be a comfort to us. It should shock us out of the systems that, that involve us, or that make us selfish and, and do nothing for people. And that's hard. It's a whole lot easier if we were just, if we could just wrap it up and close it and say happily ever after there, that's the end. And they, and, and, and that's how we usually tell this story. We're so busy saying Hosanna and hallelujah and Christ is risen that we don't deal with what that actually means. And what that actually means is, is something beautiful, something just as joyful, but it's even more joyful because it's ongoing. It is a story that we are part of. It is a story that, that we can participate in. That's pretty good. But it's also really scary. Because we don't know where we're going. We don't know what the, the next steps are. But what we do know is that God loves us. God is with us. And God is, is pushing us out of the tomb pushing us into the world, telling us to go to Galilee, telling us to go to the places where we've been before, but with a new understanding, with an understanding that the people that we used to think were our enemies are our friends. The people that we used to think were the powerful ones are not powerful. And the things that we used to be afraid of won't last. Jesus does die, but that's not the end. We will die, but that's not the end. Easter is pointing towards something that we still don't understand, but it's hope. And it's scary, but it's hope. So I didn't no note it, but if you've been watching these videos these last several years, every year I, I go to this tomb. I like the way this specific tomb looks like. I'm at the Allegheny Cemetery in Lawrenceville. Uh, it's a beautiful place. Uh, cemeteries are beautiful. They were designed to be public parks. If you notice during the video, I keep looking around because people keep driving by or walking by because it's a beautiful day and people are out. Cemeteries are filled with life. They're also filled with reminders of lives that are not here anymore. But this is not the end. This shouldn't be a scary, sad place. The, the reality is that if, we, if what we believe is true, if what we hope for is true, that all of the lives here, that, that their story isn't done that the, the body that's interred here, I don't know who this is, I just like the shape of this tomb, but whoever is interred here, that their story is not done. And it doesn't mean that we won't end up here. We will all end up here, not the specific one, but we'll, always, we'll all end up in the tomb. But that's not where we stop. That's not where our story ends. It goes through the tomb. The hope that we have is for something bigger than this. And if we truly believe that, then that's scary. <laughs> because that means we don't know what's coming next. What's past this? I don't know, but it's something great. And we aren't told exactly what it is other than it's something great. And so we shouldn't be afraid of this. We shouldn't be afraid of places like this. We should be able to go to places like this and see the life that is around us to know that the story is still being told, that we can dance through the graveyards with joy, knowing that while we will 
make a stop in this place, that this isn't our final destination. Nor is it for any of these people. There is hope beyond the grave. And we have that this day. So you may be afraid. You may run away and not tell anyone, and that's okay. Because that's not the end either. Because eventually, the women do tell people. And eventually, people do believe them. And eventually, we heard it. So if you don't feel like you can tell people today, that's okay. But live in such a way that you believe this to be true. Live in such a way that other people can see this story through your actions, even more than your words. Live in such a way that you are willing to give of your life to care for others. That is the story of the resurrection. That is the hope we have in a God who is big enough to defeat death for all of us and to defeat the fear of a system that is predicated on power and control and death. Let's go from this place with joy. Let's dance through the graveyards. Let us run through the graveyards. As many people are doing ride bikes through graveyards. Uh, let's go and, and be alive together, knowing that death is not the end for us, that we have a life beyond this. And let us help one another to live truly. Happy Easter to you. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Now let's go and live that truth. Amen. This is the power of Christ in me.
to final breath Jesus commands my destiny No power of hell No scheme of man Can ever plug me from his hand Till he returns Or calls me home Here in the power of Christ I'll stand So now it's time for us to leave this place, to go back to our regularly scheduled lives and to do good things and to see God alive in the world. Our goal is not to bring God to a world in which God is not already there, but to notice, to follow God into a world in which God is alive and active, bearing witness to God and all that we say and do. To truly believe that the tomb is empty, that we see the remnants of death and know that the, the, the signs of resurrection are there, that miracles still happen and that we have a role in helping to bring about those miracles. We have a role in helping and bringing about the kingdom of God to help this world be the world that God uh, is making it to be. A world not of judgment and wrath and fear, uh, but a, a world of love, a world of peace, and a world of uh, true community. So let's go into that world and let's bear witness to a story that is still at the beginning, a story that is still a little scary and uncertain, but a story that is exciting because we have the confidence uh, that God loves us and God is with us and God loves them and God is encouraging us to be with them. So let's go. And as we go, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. I hope you have a fantastic Resurrection Sunday, a fantastic Easter. I hope you do great things. I hope you have a lovely Easter feast or do whatever you want. I hope you enjoy this wonderful weather uh, and that spring is here and that Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Have a great day. We'll see you next week.